and even charity. Is that right? You tend to think about um, who can I bless? How can I be the hands and feet of Jesus during this time of year? And so I, um, I would just want to share a little bit of how we got to this. And I'm going to invite Deb Powell to come up and be a part of this conversation this morning. Yeah, come on up, Deb. I've got your own microphone right here. And, um, you know, how many of you remember Miss Deb Powell a few months ago when we made a really hard decision to have her transition from children's ministry to just be super available to the city? And it was an obedience step that was really hard. It was harder for Deb, I think, in her heart. It was hard for me because it was like, what about the children? What about, you know, this great woman who has served and sown in our community? Like, this doesn't seem very honoring. But it was, it was the Lord pushing her because God is using her mightily in our city. And we needed to share her. Um, and it's not just since that time. This is something you've been looking at for a while. But Deb's um, got a message that she's sharing with our whole pastoral community, um, with those that are thinking about compassion ministries, um, charitable ministries. And it's a conversation that we haven't looked at this way. And... Um, so I want to ask, I wanted to invite Deb. So just welcome Deb. Woo! Our wonderful champion of all things beautiful and our voice in the city. Um, God's voice in the city. I wanted to ask you some questions. So I'm going to interview Deb a little bit and lead us into this conversation. So um, God started speaking to you a long time ago about... Uh, those that we would look at and say maybe they're marginalized or walking in a measure of brokenness, that's specifically um, poverty, or just would you share a little bit about how God broke your heart and caught your attention for a specific group of people? I can do that. Yeah. It's on? It's on. Yeah, okay. So um, actually way, way early, way, way early when I gave my life to the Lord, I was always drawn to those marginalized, disenfranchised, and there was a fellow over in, I went to church over in Corvallis, and there was a fellow that used to just walk and walk and walk and walk and walk all over the city. And um, I was talking to him. Come to find out he had been a professor at OSU, and just kind of sometimes super brilliant folks are kind of on the edge, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was sharing with him about Jesus and just visiting with him and visiting with him. And uh, one of the pastors at the church I went to, uh, pulled me aside that morning and said, Debbie, it's not appropriate for a Christian young woman to be with those people. Ah, oh, uh, I was just telling him about Jesus. So um, I, that broke my heart. That just broke my heart because we're all, we're all exactly broken, all of us in different ways, you know, and he came to redeem us all. He loves every single one of us. Yay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, so he put a love in your heart for Total. those yeah. people, yeah. Uh, which was a, them. right. Yeah. And I think, I think that my voice is a lot louder than Debbie's. I can talk louder. I have four I'll kids. I'll try to whisper know. a okay. little quieter. I'll be louder. Is um, that better? Yeah. Okay. Is it better? Okay. Well, I think that that statement that that man made is part of the, the problem that we want to talk about today, right? I think it is. There's yes. an us and them mentality. Mm -hmm. And God wants to shatter that mindset and that box. That's right. And so um, in all of your years of service in our community, which are many, you've seen a lot of things and you've ministered to a lot of broken people. Mm -hmm. And um, there's measures of poverty that um, you've ministered to and the three that we've talked about are situational poverty, mm -hmm. generational poverty, and relational poverty. Can you explain a little bit about what that is? Sure, I can. Um, so situational poverty would be something like uh, a catastrophic medical emergency that just took all your money. Oh, no, I've never been here before. Uh, 
loss of a job suddenly. Oh my gosh, uh, house fire maybe. So those are things that that's not your lifestyle to be in need. Um, that's not how you survive. Uh, it's just, oh my gosh, how did this happen? I've never been here before. So that's situational poverty. Um, loving serves anybody who needs help. But I would say oftentimes I see those maybe needing help less than a year, and then they're back up on their feet. Awesome. Generational poverty is, um, so that's how you were raised. And really in this country we probably are on the fourth fifth generation of generational poverty you know in the um fdr the the new deal where the trying to b rebuild our country so there was the infrastructure that got to be built you know road stuff gave people work and gave people um help to survive well then the work part went away but the help just stayed and so you give people, give people things where they can um, live, maybe um, survive because you give them food, clothing, housing, that kind of stuff, but not really thrive, really. And the church kind of did the same thing. This is how we help people. Oh, dear, let's give them, let's give them. Um, that's maybe not the best way to help on a continual basis. So I, I love this little section about how we got here, because I think it's a very important conversation. I don't think we realize um, systemically how deep it goes mm -hmm. with generational poverty in our world, mm -hmm. specifically in the United States. Right. And so she was just explaining about how, you know, during FDR's um, presidency, it got started. But right now, talk about right now what the state of affairs are and how that surround sound thing that we have going on. Like with the children? Yeah. Is that what you want to talk yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So in the last, um, so we do that. The church does that. The government does that. We just give to people and give to people, usually around their physical needs, food, clothing, shelter. And so if you think about um, our children, so a lot of our children get free breakfast at school. They get free lunch at school. They get sent home a backpack of food uh, for the weekends. They get free school supplies. They get Close. free Christmas gifts. I do that too. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> and, and you know what? We are treating them as if they were orphans when in fact they have parents. How do you think those parents feel? I know when we've brought um, compassion gifts, Christmas gifts, and um, food to people's apartments during Christmas for years. We used to do it here I don't know, 20 years ago, whenever we did it, um, oftentimes if there was a dad in the house, he's running out the back door when we show up. He's um, embarrassed. He's grieved that he's not able to provide for his family. When we do things like that, we're convincing him even more. You can't. We can. You're incompetent. Let us do it. With generational poverty, it's a cultural thing. The children grow up in that. They learn that. That's how my culture is. That's what we do. Um, so what do you think these children that have all those things provided, when they have children, what do you think they're going to think? It's not my responsibility. Come on. Come on. And um, that's not how God created us. God created us with gifts and talents and purposes in life and, and to have an abundant life, to be a participating member. And, and we are telling them they are incapable when we continue to give like that. Yeah. I think that right there is, even if we just stopped on that idea right there and talked around that, it's such a powerful um, revelation of the state of affairs. Um, you know, we, our compassion, our heart wants to reach out, and we should. And that's one of the things, it's very biblical to reach out. It's very biblical to show acts of compassion, to take care of the poor, and to do those things. But Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you, right? He didn't say, your mission field now is to only reach the poor and to meet their needs. What he said was what? Go into all the world and make disciples. And he said the same type of thing in Genesis when 
he spoke to Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful and multiply. And they both speak to raising people up into family and calling them into maturity and to making sons and daughters that will grow up to be mothers and fathers who will have sons and daughters that will grow up to be mothers and fathers. And we're talking about generational prosperity, generational blessing, generational abundance, and equipping and pulling people up and creating powerful people that are great grandmas and grandpas who have understood what it means to equip people to live powerful lives. And what we're talking about right now is society, through really great ideas and great heart compassion, has missed that moment where it said, go, raise people up, make disciples, come alongside of one another, mentor them, give them a hand up, not a hand out. I mean, Jesus talked about, he, show, he modeled compassion when he fed them. He modeled that. But he didn't only model compassion. He modeled a whole lot of other things by taking those 12 guys with him and showing them how to do this stuff and telling them to go and do the same thing. And so that's, that's where we want to camp on this conversation for a little while today. It is not right that we treat humanity as though they are orphans when they are children of God, when they are children with royal heritage, with an inheritance and with access, just like me and you, to the riches of heaven. It is not godly that we do that. It's not right. And so we have to repent uh, in the whole Greek sense of change our mind. We have to have a mindset change that says, I won't just let my compassion override the great commission to raise up disciples. You have to have both. And now we're in a little bit of a problem where we have to still do compassion ministry because we've created, not just us, I mean, we're, now we're in it, but we've, we've created a powerless society who do not know how to do things for themselves. So many of us in this room are on assistance. Many of us in this room are walking through some areas of brokenness when it comes to this. And if that's you today, there is no shame in that. So I just want to break shame off of anyone right now that would feel that in the room today. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, is God wants to do a new thing in us. And he wants to bring wholeness into our city. He wants to bring wholeness into our families. He wants to bring wholeness into our generational line. Because that's what he always set out for us. And so that's our conversation. That is our conversation. <laughs> so Deb has been jumping into some stuff. And um, that's the status of affairs. What's the hope that we have? You want to talk a little bit about what God's been showing you? Well, just what she was saying, that we need to disciple. We need to walk along with people. Um, I want to use that fun analogy she had about the difference between a handout and a yeah. hand up. So um, if you could imagine, um, Joe Ray, you just fell on the ground. You poor dear, and you can't get up. And she's calling out for help. Help me, help me, I can't get up, I can't get up. Roger came over and saw her there and said, oh, dear, you poor thing. You've been there a long time. I bet you're hungry. Let me bring you some food and water. There you go. Did she help? Did he help? Sure, he helped, but it was a handout. It wasn't a hand up. It wasn't the help she needed. It was. It, well, she's probably hungry. She might have been hungry. Yeah, might have been hungry. Are you might hungry, hungry. Jory? No, she's not <laughs> hungry right now. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> and, then, and then Emily came by and said, Oh my goodness, Joe Ray, you've been there so long. That's a cold, hard, concrete floor. I bet you're really cold. Let me bring you a blanket. Here you go. Oh, did, she, did Emily help her? Sure, she did. But was it a handout? Yeah, it wasn't a handout. Didn't help her up and out of her situation. And then Pam came by. Thanks, Pam. Pam came over and saw Joe Ray laying there and said, Oh, bless your heart. Oh, no. And she got really up close to her, and she reached down, and she picked her up, and they struggled and struggled and, ugh, and got her up and walked her out of the room. 
So that was really the help she needed. Yeah. But it cost Pam something, more than just, here's a dollar, here's a package of diapers, here's this. It cost her time, cost her effort. Both of them struggled to help. Yeah. So the, and walked her out. So that's what we're talking about, the difference between um, charity compassion, I'll give you some food and water and a blanket, and redemptive compassion or developmental compassion, where you actually work with them and walk alongside them. Yeah, that's good. I underlined or I highlighted this line in uh, the literature that she's teaching. And it says, need will not change until we address, until we change how we address need. Need will not change until we change how we address need. And I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So it's important that we still help people. Yeah. So if, if we were going to use an analogy of what you just shared, if Joe Ray's leg was broken and she couldn't walk on her own from there on out, the assistance to like walk with, mm -hmm. and maybe because her leg was broken and she couldn't get to the stove, she would need a meal. Sure, there is some sure. supportive things while she's walking into wholeness that still need to happen if she's willing to do the work. Right. And, and that's the thing. It's not, we're not saying all compassion ministry must stop. That would be wrong. That would be wrong because right. this is a change of mind. This culture doesn't shift overnight. And this, is, mm -hmm. this has had a vice grip on our nation in fact, the spirit of poverty is the one thing I think that could really undo just the democracy side of it. The, the whole, it's, it's been systemically supporting us to go into a really ugly mm -hmm. political situation based on poverty. Mm -hmm. And it has a vice grip on us, but God is bigger. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's actually when you have a mindset change, it resets the standard. We can begin to live and think a new way. And it doesn't have to take generations upon generations. It can start with this generation. Mm -hmm. We don't have to, like, it doesn't have the whole, like, it creeps in slowly. Once the mindset changed and the hope is released, hope is a lot more powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so much more powerful than the other. And so I, I think it could shift in one generation. So that's what we're talking about today. But it requires, it requires our time. It requires us. It's not going to happen. Part of the problem is us. Even it's crept into the church, the way that we come in. And we've talked about this before. We come in sometimes to church as consumers. I have a need today. And we just want, you know, Angela to sing a prophetic song over us. And I want that. Yeah, thank you. It's the best thing ever. <laughs> And what we need to do sometimes is get in front of our mirror and sing a prophetic song over ourselves. And that will bring the greatest shift and the greatest change. And so when we come into this room and we have all these gifts inside of us and we wait for someone else to pull them out or to release theirs because we don't feel like it or because we don't have confidence or whatever the reasons are that we don't come up and shine as children are supposed to, it perpetuates this consumerism thing. And so we need it to stop in the church. We need it to stop in our schools. We need it to stop in our nation. It just needs to stop. We need to step into the kingdom mindset. Amen. Yeah. So what is this conversation that we're, we're starting to call it redemptive compassion. So there's that charitable compassion. Um, and then there's developmental compassion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is redemptive. Can you talk a little bit about um, what redemptive compassion, like there's these values, what does it look like? Mm -hmm. So um, I can just read these yeah, values. Um, everyone has value. Every single one of us was created by God with gifts, talents, purpose. We're, we're his kids. Oh, my gosh. Everybody has value. I want to stop you there for a second. Okay. We all know that everyone has value, right? We know that. Yes, yes. But sometimes we, when we do these the other way is the charitable compassion. It, like I said, it creates this us and them mentality. And I think on some level, we feel good and higher and a little bit more righteous. Let's just speak to that nasty thing right now. 
and say it for what it is. Sometimes our, our compassion is to make us feel better and not that this person has value. So I think, like, even like right now, let's just take a moment and repent for that. God, we do. We recognize that ugly thing of sometimes our love is to make ourselves feel better. And so um, where we have stepped out in our own self-indulgence and our own to, to meet those needs in ourself, God, we repent for that. And we want to give out of the overflow and the understanding that every single person has value, that we're all equal, we were all created in your image, God. And we are just being you to other people. And so God, would you change our minds in that, in your name. Um, we are called to invest relationally in one another. He did tell us to go make disciples, not just to make converts and say, have a great life, goodbye. Um, he did call us to walk alongside one another. And that takes time. That takes us. We're, um, we're such a busy, busy, busy culture. Well, I don't have time to do that. I don't have time. I'd say take it up with him because he's the one that told you to do it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, everyone has capacity and potential. Again, he's placed gifts and talents and, and purposes, works for each one of us to complete that he, before we were even formed. So potential, everyone has potential. Uh, mutual participation is important. Again, if we do for them, say, you have potential, you can do this and this, come on, let's go. And they're back there just kicking back. Um, that's not working with them. That's not developmental compassion. Uh, you walk alongside them as long as they're ready to go and when they stop walking then you just wait because they can't it's not going to help them it's not going to develop who they were called to be if you do again do it for them you're still screaming at them you can't I can do you see what I mean okay uh, we must use wisdom and discernment I love Important that one. you know there's um, there's there's three involved there's the person that needs help that's fallen. There's us that's going to help. And there's God that's doing a work in their life. You know, sometimes if we try to circumnavigate what he's trying to do in their life, they don't learn the lesson he's trying to teach. They don't grow in the way he's trying to grow them. We run in and rescue when there's a consequence from a bad choice. That doesn't teach them very well not to make that choice. We need to use wisdom. Ask him. Ask him, what are you doing here and what's my part in it? Right. Where am I? Okay. Uh, what, what we do should transform. You know, it, it breaks our heart. When we just do charity, compassion alone, giving to people, giving to people, food, clothing, shelter, uh, whatever they, they need, they can, they, we allow them to stay trapped in a prison of poverty trapped in a prison of not being the person that they're called to be. You know, if you talk to someone who's in poverty, a lot of us would say poverty is a lack of finances, a lack of. Oftentimes what people, especially in generational poverty, describe it as more in emotional and psychological terms, I'm worthless, I can't, I, I, I'm not able to do that, that's not for me, this is my lot in life. Do you see the difference there? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, in, in our culture, just church or otherwise, in culture right now, we like measurables, don't we? We like massive impact. Like, the greater the impact, the better it must be. And the, many, the more people it can touch, the better it could be, right? And so I think some of the campaigns that we do we do with that in mind. Like, we're going to attract as many people as we can to receive the love of Jesus by doing these compassionate acts, these charitable compassions. And we're going to hit them with a broad brushstroke. And it's a really good idea. But the massive impact actually isn't taking place. It's not the numbers of people that walk in the building. It's the amount of lives that are transformed. Yeah, exactly. And our measurables have to shift from you know, 
data to transformation. It can't be about how many coats we gave out this year. It can't be about how many crayons we handed out this year. It can't be about how many Christmas gifts were given or lunches or dinners. That's amazing. But if lives are not transformed in the process, it looks a lot like the end of Corinthians 13 where, you know, it says, I've done all these things and I was a clanging gong. It was nothing. If it's not done in love and there's not transformation, it's a lot of, it's like when you fast and God didn't tell you to. It's like you just missed a lot of really good food. <laughs> so you're doing all this stuff and you spent a lot of money and you got really tired and you did some good things and you felt good and other people felt good in the process. But no transformation was happening. And we need to shift our, what our impact looks like. How many people through the doors of whether it's been Love, Inc. or God's Heart or the church here, when we've done gen, uh, just the compassion, the charitable compassion, how many, how many lives have you seen total transformation out of generational poverty? A fairly small percentage. Right. Yeah. Some do because they're ready. And, mm -hmm. and that small percentage usually are like, Deb, how can I help you? Deb, how can I be close There's to you? That. Deb. Or whoever, it's like it, te it tends to be the, that they're ready and someone goes like this. And there's relationship. Yeah, there's it's relationship. Through relationship, right. That's where the real transformation happens. Mm -hmm. We're not saying stop doing the charitable stuff. It does get people in the door and it does help people. Mm -hmm. And it's important. And as they're developing, they're mm -hmm. going to need that. To continue. To continue. You can't, you can't just say, oh, we're just going to be developmental compassion. We're not going to help you in the interim. Right. It has to be helped through. So I think the big thing I want to say is we're used to doing this with a lot of people. I want, your, I want your anxiety meter to go down a lot. Because when we're saying throw your life in with someone else and give them a hand up and walk alongside of them, we're not saying to do this... To, in multitudes, within the masses. It's like what dad said earlier today, two by two. You see a hand up asking for help, just take one person with you. It's, it's really just done relationally, one-on-one, -on -one, two by two. We're not saying take 300 people and start a movement overnight. We're saying let's disciple. And who in your life needs generational poverty broken? Maybe it's you. We need discipleship, Good. mentoring. We do. Okay. What's next? What's next? What do you want to talk about next? A class? Well, we talked about meeting need but ignoring people. And we've talked about the generational, like how we got here. I think we're talking in, about, yeah, what's next. So what's a pathway that we can um, step into this? Because it really is a mindset change. Mm -hmm. And you have a pathway to help people with I do that. have a pathway. Mm -hmm. And Emily has graciously offered the minutorium to have this class in. Um, there's a 12-week class. There's a woman, um, back up just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a woman named Lois Tupi. She's an executive director over in Idaho, in Napa, Idaho, of a Love, Inc. And um, for years, she served those in poverty. And she was just grieved that they just stayed the same. She didn't see a change in their life. She didn't, you know, she could see the potential there, but it just, they were petrified with fear to do anything different because this is how they'd survive for generations. And she fell to her knees. She searched the scripture. She cried out to the Lord, there's got to be a different way of helping. And, and the way she felt was what she wrote a book called Redemptive Compassion. And um, there's a website, redemptivecompassion.org. You can learn more about it. And, um, and so then she started sharing that with the church. Her heart's desire was for the church to help in a more, perhaps more biblical way. And then they said, that sounds great. How do we do that? Now what? And so then she wrote a class, had a curriculum where you just walk through it with people. You go through it and then can understand more. 12 weeks, it's great. It looks at um, different areas of our life. She used an analogy of a wagon uh, a prairie schooner, you know, and whatever they're called, wagon, covered wagon. That's the word I'm looking for. Thanks, Charlotte. <laughs> 
And she talks about, so the wagon bed is things in our lives. And, and, you know, when they went across the prairie, they thought they needed all these things. And most oftentimes, a lot of stuff, just survival, it was out. It was just baggage dragging them down. Um, talked about the covering, the covering's prayer. Um, the, um, the wheels, the four wheels. So in order to move across to a new destination, you need all four wheels functioning well. You had a broken wheel, you're not going to roll real well. So, so one wheel is that, that physical wheel. Um, the needs that we always help with, the food, clothing, shelter, those kind of things, that's a physical wheel. And that's the one people always ask about. Another one is um, the relational wheel. Who's in your corner? Who are you living, doing life with? Are they going to be happy if you want to change your, your ways, if you want to move into your potential? Mm, maybe maybe you should look at that, look at that a little bit. Another one is our um, emotional. Um, you know, if, if we ask you guys when you came in, how are you? Oh, I'm, I'm just great. I'm just great. We hide that emotional place that's really at the very core of who we are. So let's look at that wheel and see how sound that is. And the other one, probably the most important one, is the spiritual wheel. What is the foundation of your belief? You know, we, um, and she wrote this from the belief that we serve our God. <laughs> but some people's God is different. Some people's God is, is education or um, enlightenment. And that shifts, kind of difficult to look at. So that's another part of the wheel they look at. And then um, it moves into dreaming. You know, a lot of people in generational poverty, they don't dream. There's not hope out there. There's not a different life out there. This is their lot in life. This is what they were born into. It's what their grandparents did. It's what their great grand. That's just how it is. And so you kind of try to re 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 I can't even talk. reawaken mm -hmm. those dreams, those, those hopes and dreams that were planted by God inside of them and encourage them to um, dream again. And then walk alongside and, you know, goals and steps and all that. Um, but I think it's a fantastic class. We're just finishing up. We have one more week. We did a pilot class over in Lebanon. And um, it's been pretty amazing. You know, we think probably, oh, we're good. We're good. I was really surprised when a lot of people, and I had to go through the class too. That's how we got trained. Is you go, oh, oh, dear. Thanks, Holy Spirit. And <laughs> looking at that, I can see that wheel's not so good. And um, so it's been really fun to watch um, people's countenance just change, the hope come into their hearts. Yeah. I think what you just said there is really important because I think we all have a lot of room to grow in these areas, you know. I think probably when you listed off these different wheels, there was a lot of us that said, oh, yeah, I could use more reinforcement in that or, you know, I, I know I can. And um, so I feel like if you were to take this class, if you were to jump in in this pathway, it's not so that you can learn so much so that you can help other people. I think you first, we first have to start and look at ourselves and say, God, where do you want to bring alignment and wholeness into these broken places inside of me? And I think this is a really important thing for all of us to look at church-wide. There isn't one of us in this room that don't have an area where the Holy Spirit wants to put his searchlight. And um, it's time for us to get whole so that we can empower people into the same wholeness that we're walking in. Um, there, I want to, can I? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It's okay. Um, so there was a class last, uh, not a class, but there was an informational gathering and a lot of church leaders came last week for the dinner. We invited you guys to come and, and hear about this class and, um, a couple weeks ago actually. And I was sitting at a table with one woman by herself and she was this packet here. She was reading through it. She was rattling. She was talking under her breath. She was very into it. And I tried, she had a a badge on that she worked for a, a Christian school. And um, I said, oh, what do you do at that? I don't want to like rat her out. So what do you do at that school? And she said, oh, I drive bus. And I had thought she, you know, maybe was a teacher or administrator or something. And um, in getting to talk to her, she came to the class thinking, or the informational thing, thinking that she was ready to jump into the class for the first night of the class. 
And she was reading through this material out loud because at some point she said to me, you know, I don't read very well. If I don't read out loud, I can't comprehend the information. And she just was telling her story a little bit. And then in the middle of the class, she kind of just basically says, like, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, as we're talking about, we need to, we need to come alongside. We need to embrace this as a church. She just kind of just had enough and was like, I'll believe it when I see it. I've been asking for this my whole life. I know that there's something more for me, and I don't know how to get there, and no one will tell me. I'll believe it when I see it. And she said, I can rip holes through all of this. No one will do this. And it was heartbreaking. It was like she was sent like an angel from the Lord to catch her attention and say, this is very important. And us just saying like, reading through the materials and going, that's really good. I hope Deb can get that going. I hope Love Inc. can pull this off. Is not going to work. There's some of you in our room right now that are thinking the exact same thing that this woman was saying. I'll believe it when I see it. And some of you are not even ready for the shift to happen. Like, it's a hardship to get out of your old way of thinking, to lay the old stuff aside, and to say, yeah, I'm going to embrace wholeness. It's hard for all of us to say, I'm going to stop doing this and I'm going to start doing that, right? Whether it's stop smoking, start running, whatever it is that, you know, is keeping us, if it's, we've been avoiding dealing with trauma in our whole life and now we need to finally find a counselor that can lead us through something. Like, we need to stop avoiding wholeness. But there's some people that aren't ready to do it. But that doesn't mean that we don't go. It doesn't mean that we don't start. And so for those of you that are saying in here, I'll believe it when I see it, I, I feel your pain. I, I want to see it. I want to believe that this is true. Because this is what God is asking us to do. This is where he's asking us to go. Whether it's just in redemptive compassion or ourselves getting whole, or ourselves coming alongside of someone and saying, this is who Jesus is in my life. What's he doing in yours? If he did this for me, he'll do it for you. Telling each other our stories, telling each other our testimonies, and saying, God is still doing this. Come on, I can believe this for you. And and wrapping our arms around one or two people and saying, let's live life together. Let's walk through the hard stuff together. I'm gonna help pull you up. And then it's reciprocal. There's going to be times when I'm down, and I need a helping hand up. And people have come alongside and said, come on, girl, that's not who you are. That's what, I love the line, affirming potential. Because we are called to empower one another. I don't know where Chris Hoff is, but we were called to empower one another. That's a ministry that he started. To to encourage dreaming. It's an important thing. And it's not just for the wealthy. It's not just for the ones that look nice on the outside. It's not for the ones that have seemingly a good family. It's for everybody. God created us all to dream. And so it's a choice, though. It's an invitation. It's really a command from Jesus. But we don't have to obey if we don't want to but I pray that we will. I pray that we will step into the Great Commission today. (laughs) We have to. And there's people in this room that are hoping that someone else will do it. And maybe a couple people will, but you guys, we have to stop hoping that someone else will do it. And we have to say, I know who I am enough, and I know who he is in me enough to start giving that love away. We have to. This isn't, a, this isn't a spanking. This isn't a rebuke. This is an invitation from the Lord to change our world. This is an invitation from the Father to see his kingdom come, to see his will be done. Let's start right here in Albany.
this woman that came, she left with hope that night. She had doubts and she had fears, but she left with hope. And that's the whole thing. We have a hope. We have a future. We have a destiny. And we can call other people into it because they have a hope. They have a future. They have a destiny. So talk about affirming potential class a little <laughs> bit more. Okay. All right. So you're all come. <laughs> it's here from 6 to 8 on Wednesday nights starting the 9th of January. Of January. Oh, yeah, that's right, because it's not even December yet. Whew. Got a whole month before Christmas. Okay. Um, and um, we'll feed you a meal. I think that's really part of doing a relationship. I think so, too. I think it's a great part. It's been so fun, the classes we've done. We do some other classes of faith and finances, and we've done this class. And we always start it with a meal, breaking bread together, and it's great. So six to eight, 12-week class um, in the Mediterranean. In the Minotorium. So that's here. So how many of you have heard of Alpha? It's a, it's a, it's a discipleship course. It, this reminds me of Alpha. Um, and this Alpha was started by businessmen to reach their own community. And um, am I right? Because I know you guys have taught Alpha for years. And it really just, the people that you're already in relationship with, inviting them into doing life with you, taking a class to grow in certain areas of character, and, and really it's to find Jesus. Um, but you invite them to a meal. And one of the things that they say here is that community helps people thrive, not just survive. That is so true. I know it's been so true in my own life. When I'm surrounded, when I'm in community, when I'm living amongst family, I'm thriving. How many of you can relate to that? When you've been isolated, when you've been alone, when you've felt forsaken and like nobody cared how well were you doing in life you get down in the in the mud and the muck and it's hard to get out you get in the pity party and the there's this whole thing we were meant to walk together you can go and look at nature it's like all throughout it you know you get picked off when you're a lone ranger community is where people thrive and not everybody understands how to be in a family not everybody has been in a family not everybody knows how to have manners or take their turn talking or not eat all the food before everybody has had a chance to get some. <laughs> I go to the potlucks. <laughs> I see how it goes. <laughs> like, family calls each other higher. Family tells the truth. Family says, don't do that. Stop doing that. That's not serving you. It's rude. Yeah, sometimes they say that's rude. <laughs> It's a huge deal today. How many of you, let's just be honest in the room today. How many of you grew up in a family with both your mom and dad and were raised by both your mom and dad? How many, that's amazing. How many of you were not? That's still a lot. How many of you were latchkey kids? Like after school you went home and no one was there. You got yourself your own food. You kind of watch TV with your babysitter. Like, there's a lot of people that that is true of them. Like, family means different things to different people. And we get to define what it looks like to be a kingdom family together. That's part of what this affirming potential class is. It's about coming together, sharing a meal together, doing life with one another, and talking about these issues, about these areas of brokenness, and calling each other higher. And saying, don't do that. Or, good job. I love what you're doing right there. Or, show me how to do that. Because that is really working well for you. And what I'm doing is not working. Is this making sense? And it's super important. What else powerful do you have to say right now, Deb? Um, I am excited about this. I heard about this class a couple of years ago when I went back to a national conference, and it just rang in my heart. I, um, I love people. God has put that in my heart. I, I really do love, and I, I think we were called to love, love, and go. And, and this is, I just heard so much um, 
fruit. I, I went to a few graduations of people, and really, they went from um, eviction, had lost their children, no job, um, and just walking beside in relationship with the church family, really see restoration happen, just transformation, children back, uh, a church family, a job, a home, a, a, lot of, a lot of stuff, just broken families ready to split up, restored, a lot of restoration. And it's just, it's just feet to the redemptive compassion philosophy. I believe it's a more biblical philosophy than just charity, compassion alone. Mm-hmm. And um, I just hope the church jumps into it. And so Love, Inc. in particular is making this shift. And, and we're Love, Inc., in case you didn't know. Yeah, yeah you are. Love, Inc. is not Debbie and Roger. Thank um, goodness. We are Love, Inc. All the churches in Albany are Love, Inc. Love, Inc. stands for love in the name of Christ. We make that work. And so in order for it to happen, where the shift can be made to not just charitable compassion, but to redemptive it requires us. And so this morning, Dad said to me, he goes, I think there's a commissioning that's supposed to happen. I agree. Yes. I think if you want to be commissioned, even if it's just a prophetic statement today, to make a choice to step into the Great Commission one person at a time. That's how it starts. One person at a time. You may not be able to say yes to affirming potential class. Like, that's an confines and a certain framework, you may not be able to make that Wednesday 6 to 8 p.m., but what you can do is embrace at least one person and begin to do life with someone that needs a hand up and that's willing to take a hand up and not a hand out. And so I think some of the commissioning today is I want us to ask the Lord And this is going to be an invitation. You can't insert yourself without permission. Some of it may be groundwork that you have to just invite people into your home and do life with them for a while. Say that again? Yeah, Dad said it might be people in this church that you invite. That is so true. Who here feels like you need to grow in this area of growing in maturity and, like, not just in reaching out, but growing in these Areas of poverty that we talked about, generational, relational, the, those, your four wheels are a little rattly. Keep your hands up. How many of you have your wheels being rattly? Okay, are we all being honest? Everybody feels like their wheels are tight and locked and loaded and ready to go? If that is the case, friends, let's get running and start discipling people. Uh, no, no, it's not all about money. We're talking about relationships, m- emotional health, mental health, physical needs. Like, it could be your physical health. It could be financial. Are all of our wheels locked and loaded, ready to go? We're ready to change the world. Superwoman, Superman, we are? Okay, friends. It's not true. I'm going to call, your, I'm gonna call your, your poo-poo. That is not true. We are not fully healthy. <laughs> if we were, we would be changing the world. If you think that you're completely healthy, you should be changing the world around you. And everyone around you should be like, holy cow, look at them go. When they walk into a room, the room changes. And some of you, that happens. And every single person that you come in contact with knows that Jesus loves them, knows that they have potential, knows that they are called to something more. Like, we have to begin to live that way ourselves so we can call people into it. Let's just be honest. We're not all doing that. I'm not doing that all the time. And I invite you to say, Hey, lady, friend, sister, I know who you are. I have people in my life that do tell me that. Do you have people in your life that are saying that to you? (laughs) They're too scared.
I thought about reading this this morning when I had these scriptures come to me, but I didn't. I think it was really meant for now. And keep in mind, this, this has nothing to do with the second wheel. Wait, wait a minute, third wheel. If, if you know you need emotional healing, that kind of thing, get it. But having said that, I think Jesus was saying to all these disciples, they weren't really fixed. But he said, follow me. Why do you keep looking backward to your past and have second thoughts about following me? When you turn back, you're useless to God's kingdom realm. Then he said, after this, each team was two disciples, 70 in all, he 35 teams. He formed 35 teams, two disciples, 70 in all, and he commissioned them to go ahead of him in every town he was about to visit. But he said that after saying, why do you keep looking backward to your past and have second thoughts about following me? When you turn back, you're useless to God's kingdom realm. A lot of the things that happened for the disciples happened on the way as they were going, including probably emotional health. They didn't deny that. They didn't say, I won't fix that. But it was like as they were going. All of us, like she said, all of us got stuff. I got stuff. At seven, near, I'm going to be 70 in March. We all have things in the back of our minds like, eh, I kind of wish I didn't have that nagging thing. So you don't give up on that and you say, well, I want to get that fixed before I get out of here. And we should. But it doesn't, doesn't mean like, just think about your past, think about your past, and stop following Jesus. No, as you're going. Anyway. That's really good. And the truth is, is while we're in process, we can still learn from one another. This woman that came that night rocked me. Her sharing her story and where she was at exposed things inside of me that God wanted to deal with. And had she not shown up that day and given of herself and shared of herself, I would have missed that revelation. And I think that's another important thing, too. You know, we all have something to give no matter where we are in the journey. Show up. There's no cost for this. Just your time. Your time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Which is, we like to write checks a lot more sometimes than showing up. Generosity is not just about money, friends. Poverty is not just about money. Time is huge. Time is often one of the greatest gifts that you can give. I have quality time. I'm a quality time person for love language. My kids are quality time people for love language. I have, I'm surrounded by quality time people who that fills their love tank. And it's so hard. I would rather give them a gift because that's easier. You know, it's like, I want to fill your love tank and I do love you, but I don't have time. So let me do it this different way. I think at the end of the day, we're all quality time love language people, right? We, time is so valuable. And we're in short supply of it. We're entirely too busy. Yet, God still asks us for our time. And yet, the greatest way we can show one another love is to sit down with someone and listen to their story and share a meal with them and look them in the eye and not be thinking of where you need to go next. How many of us do that? Yeah, I, I just want to say I'm sorry on Sunday morning when some of you want to talk to me and I can see the next person behind you that wants my attention and I even glance at the next person. I try really hard not to do that because I want to be in the moment with you. But there's always something to steal our attention. And I wonder how, you know, how the Lord feels <laughs> when we're lost in worship and then our mind wanders our time 
our attention is one of the greatest things that we can offer to one another. And it's one of the greatest things we can offer to him. Justin and I were talking about this the other day. We were driving. And I'll just be really honest with you. I was frustrated because um, one of my team members put something together that was really incredible. And hardly anyone showed up. And I was bummed out for them that that happened. And I was just telling him, like, I'm so bummed out. How do you get people to show up, you know, for something that is going to benefit them even? And he just said, ah, he's so smart. He said, I don't know how you get them to show up. But he said, I know for myself, I just have to take the knowledge that everything that I do is worship. And when I show up, I got to be present because it's worship. And I'm doing it as unto the Lord. And I wonder how many times we disconnect from that. That we show up because of an obligation. We say yes to things because we feel manipulated, (laughs) compelled. But how many times do we just listen to what the Lord is asking us to do? And then, yeah, the whole world might be rolling around and there's all these other things. But when we do show up, we show up as unto the Lord. And we work heartily as unto the Lord. And our work is our worship. And our service is our song. And our time is our tithe. And we do all those other things too. But we're present in those moments. And we do it unto Jesus. And we give a drink of water in his name. Except I drank all of it. Um, You get what I'm saying? You guys are hungry. So we're going to start this class. This is one pathway. I want to compel you. I think it's going to be really important. Wednesday nights for 12 weeks, we actually have no life groups running right now. The only um, group that's meeting are the youth group and the young adults group. Maybe we start our year getting after our stuff getting into one another's stories. When Amy and Philip were here last year, she prophesied and she said, take the winter and sit in each other's homes and learn one another's stories because in the springtime you will build here. In the springtime. And we started that. There was a small group of us that said, hey, I'm going to do that. Maybe it's time for our church as a community to take that word and walk into it and say, in the winter, we're going to get to know one another's stories. We're going to hear one another's hearts. We're going to grow. We're going to take care of the issues of our heart. We're going to eat food together. And Debbie, you shouldn't have to make it every time. Like, we're going to start a sign-up sheet that says, who's going to help with the meal? Because we're a family. And at Thanksgiving, everybody brings something. When we do young adults dinners, everybody brings something. So we're going we're gonna to figure out a way to do that so that it kills that gimme, gimme mindset. And in the springtime, we will build here. God will build something here. Suddenly, it will happen. Come on. This is a city that God is making. He's our builder. He's our father. He's our friend. He's our leader. He is the foundation. I mean, we've just got a word about excavation and underneath, like what, you know, all of that, the city of God is happening. I've had multiple people in the last couple weeks share a word about they see heavy equipment moving things and the foundation is getting secured. That whole word that Amy gave talks about the foundation and becoming a house of restoration. And he's going to do it. We can't make it happen on our own, but we can say yes and we can walk through the door and we can be willing to give of our hearts and who we are as unto the Lord. So I want to commission us. Yes, Dana. In order for change to come and transformation from old habits like you guys have been talking about, we're going to have to be willing to let life get a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really hard for us individually. It's like, life's hard enough. I don't really want to be uncomfortable right now. We protect that layer around us and maybe don't get involved Mm -hmm. into something like this. But I think we're going to have to just say, you know what? 
Let's let things get a little uncomfortable with the day-to-day, -day, with how we feel, with our life, and let God come in and transform us and change us so that we can go out and be the difference and make a difference. Because if we're not willing to get uncomfortable, we're never going to make a difference. It's true. That's what I tell myself every time I need to go on a diet. <laughs> You're going to be uncomfortable, but you'll survive the journey. Okay, will you guys stand? I, I do feel like, and Dad, do you have something on this commissioning? No, I think it's for you guys. Okay. Deb, do you have something? Okay. Uh, uh, this is, to me, this is like one of the most important words I've heard in a long time for our church. And I've been writing this book called The Key to Revival's Restoration of Family, I've got all kinds of bells and whistles going off today as I'm listening to this because I'm seeing what they're saying about is absolutely key to this happening. And so personally, and it's going to be difficult for me, but I'm going to come to this class. And I think the commissioning really surrounds uh, the idea of those four things you know, do you want to do those four things so that you can do the kingdom? Mm -hmm. And saying yes to that. You know, it's a different kind of commissioning. It doesn't deny the supernatural things that we right. do, of healing the sick like we prayed for the sick today. But you know, it's like God is after us doing things in a relational way, not just like an individual way, trying to make ourselves look great. And so... Um, if you want to answer the call to follow Jesus, I think this is really a big part of it. It's new to us, but it's a mind shift in what's taking place. It doesn't deny the other supernatural stuff at all. But, like, we can't really change the city until we actually answer this call. Yeah. I think I just want to say this, too. You know, where we're going as a community and as a church, not just our church, but the church where God is leading us is different than where we've been before. And it doesn't diminish the amazing things that God has done in our past. And I think even what you just read about, you know, don't look in the past and like, will you follow me here? I think that's a really important thing. We love our past and it brought us to this moment. And I just even feel that way, you know, what God put in your heart about compassion to our city and to love those that maybe weren't receiving his love, um, specifically from the church. What you did in the past wasn't wrong. It was what he led you in, and it was so important, and it was foundational. But God is leading us somewhere new, and um, so we are thankful for where we were, and he did get us here, and we're going and we're following him. And even this morning in the, in the worship team room, we were, Angela was reading out of Galatians. And it reminded me of this thing that had happened in my past uh, where a, a trauma kind of thing had happened. And I had said to someone, like, someone that I really respected fell. And, um, like, morally fell. And it rattled my cage. And I said, but all of those things that they did that they were mentoring me, it's like, I guess it's just all a bunch of crap now. I guess it wasn't real. And a, a friend said, that's not true. And I was like 18 when this happened. It really rattled my cage. And I said, you know, it just must have been, that must not have been, they must have been faking. And they said, no, who you are in the spirit is who you really are. And sometimes when our flesh pokes out, we like to think like, oh, no, that's who we really are. This dysfunction is who I really am. And and I got to push it down <laughs> because I can't let it out. I want to let the spirit lead me. And we do. That's who you really are. Who you are in the spirit is who you were really meant to be. And that's who you really are. Sometimes when those ugly things pop up, that's not who you really are. And sometimes when those things in our past pop up, whether it's, you know, our history, this is who God's made us now. Who we are in the spirit now. And so he's leading us into something really great, and this is who we are. And I don't know if that made any sense. It makes sense in my head. But 
So, Lord, we say yes. Just, why don't we just lift our hands. If you have agreement in your heart about this, and even with fear, Lord, we say yes to where you're leading us. God, we submit our fear to you right now of our time, our, um, our world that could potentially get messy, the inconveniences, that are gonna crop up, Lord, we say we understand, but yes, we're willing. In spite of those things, God, we are willing. Come transform us, God, so you can transform our city. Come transform us, God, so we can look like you. Come transform us, God, because that's what you died and paid for. And when you buy something back, you buy it all the way. You don't want a partial, you don't want to pay in full for a partial um, transaction. God, you want the full transformation. It's what you paid for. So we say yes to complete surrender. Yes to complete wholeness inside of us, God. Yes to discipling. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Thank you so much, Debbie, for leading us here. Thank you. Do you you want to say something else? Okay. Thank you, guys. Oh, So if you want more information about firm, affirming potential class, there's a flyer on the information table where it says get info here, and they look like this, and it has the information about what it's going to be, and we're going to keep putting it in front of your face. If you can't be part of the class, just jump into it anyway. Get after it. Come talk to us. Okay, God bless you. Go get your kiddos. <laughs>